So good afternoon. I'm Judy Russell. I'm the Dean of University Libraries here at UF. And I'm delighted that you were able to join us today for this presentation on the unpublished Cuban botanical illustrations of Nancy Kingsbury Wallstonecraft. The manuscript entitled Specimens and Plants of Plants and Fruits of the Island of Cuba was first reported in 1828. Never been published and its location was unknown until recently. Our speaker today is Emilio Cuecto, who discovered or rediscovered the manuscript on March 31st based on a search in OCLC WorldCat. The cataloging record identified Cornell University as the institution that owned it. I'll leave it to Emilio to tell you the story of his long but ultimately successful search for the manuscript, but I want to tell you a little bit about him and explain my involvement in that of the University of Florida. Emilio came to the United States as a teenager as part of the Operation Peter Pan, a mass exodus of over 14,000 unaccompanied Cuban miners to the United States between 1960 and 1962. He attended the Catholic University of America and then obtained a master's degree at Columbia University and a law degree at Fordham University. During his successful legal career, he began to collect publications, art, and objects from and about Cuba. And since his retirement, he has dedicated himself to that effort full time. Emilio has written several books about Cuba in both English and Spanish, many of which are on display in the table there um, to my left if you want to look at them later. Uh, his most recent book is entitled Cuba in the US and it's still in our cataloging department so it's not there on the table yet, but will be shortly. It's already in the building, so to speak. Um, his book on Matanzas is due out before the end of the year and the library press at UF will be publishing his book entitled Inspired by Cuba, a survey of Cuba themed ceramics in early January. The book is based largely on his personal collection of Cuba themed ceramics, which will be exhibited here in this room beginning January 7th. So we hope many of you will be back in January to uh, see the exhibit and to see the new book. I first met Emilio as UF was establishing a collaborative program to create broad and deep open access to digital collections of Cuban materials, which we identify as celebrating Cuba, collaborative digital collections of Cuban patrimony. Since that initial meeting, we've found a number of common interests and opportunities to collaborate. When Emilio called me on March 31st to let me know that he had found a record in WorldCat that he believed to be this manuscript, he could not contain his excitement, and it was contagious. I was aware of the contemporary reports of its existence, but otherwise knew very little about the manuscript. Nevertheless, I immediately shared his hope that this missing treasure had at last been found and since then have become deeply engaged with him in the research around the author artist and the mystery of the 190 years since it was first acknowledged. We went to Cornell together last month to view the manuscript and came back even more excited about the importance of this work and its author and eager to share it with others. You've been invited here today so Emilio can place the manuscript in a historical context, trace the mystery of its journey to the archives at Cornell University Library, and now into the public view, and to share a portion of the amazing illustrations with you. Cornell has committed to digitizing the manuscript, so you will be able to see the full manuscript in a few months. Please feel free to sign up with one of the library staff who are here. Are there a couple of you who can raise your hand and let people know if you're Sarah and Pam are here in the uh, front row and Barbara in the back, if you want to get on a list to be notified as the manuscript becomes available or for other information about our Celebrating Cuba initiatives. Emilio, thank you so much for coming to share this wonderful manuscript and its interesting history with us. So I will turn the podium over to you. Good afternoon, thank you very much, all of you for taking your precious time and joining us today for an exciting trip through old books and uh, mysteries, and we're here. It's a privilege to be at UF, and it's a privilege to share with you for the first time ever the story of this lost treasure. Actually, not lost, just hidden somewhere. Um, and I'm trying to do that, and doesn't, well, maybe I, no? Oh, I see, no? I know I, it worked before, I tell you that, because I tried it. I'm not just doing the page size for you, or? No, that didn't work either. Okay. No. All right, we've got some technical help. Maybe it's not on. Okay, sorry. So 
No. It did work a second ago. Yeah. Okay. It worked. There we go. There we go. Okay. So this is where it all started, or where it's part of it ended and part of it started. That's Judith and myself at the Cornell Library on October 16th, just a few weeks ago, basically um, amazed at the discovery of this incredible manuscript, watercolor. Uh, as you can see, it's a, it's a large manuscript with very beautiful renditions of the Cuban plants. So I will tell you how we got there and where we've been ever since. This is a preliminary progress report as I am still trying to digest all the information gathered since then. It all started with that 30 of the most important Cuban bibliography by Carlos Trelles, who out of his own money printed in Cuba his bibliography in the years 1912-15. An incredible man who had the vision to include in his bibliography things that were not even books, but he thought that information should be kept for posterity. So if that man hadn't thought of doing that, we would not be here today. Treyes, in his famous bibliography, this is from 1912 book, he did it by year. Um, he had this very, um, he has this entry of a certain Mrs. Wollstonecraft written as the first name you see there, Wollstonecraft. As someone who had done some drawings of Cuban plants, who had, who, who, whose manuscript had been sent to New York for publication, if subscribers were found, and that's all he knew. Treyes hadn't seen the book, but the fact that he had read somewhere that this thing existed made him think, well, maybe we should keep this information for posterity, otherwise it would be lost. Now, Treyes got his information from a, a Cuban exile newspaper. Cubans have been in exile in the U.S. for a long time, in 1826. And in Philadelphia, a couple of exiled Cubans, um, Felix Varela and Sacco, published a um, newspaper of Cuban interest and they, in, they themselves had seen this in another newspaper, so they copied this information for the Cuban people. So Treyes saw that and decided to, a century later, convey it to us. Now the pieces of the puzzle are on the right. The poor Mrs. Wollstonecraft has been spelled with any possible name, and that of course has made the complication of finding this thing, because you know if you spell something wrong, the internet certainly will not help you because you have to have the right name. So all those names have to be used in order to complete the puzzle we're speaking here today. Well, this is Cuba where it's located, you all know, but nevertheless, you can see how close it is to the US. And Cuba was a destination for many Americans, especially from the East Coast, um, mostly for health reasons in the 19th century. So a lot of Americans went to Cuba and that's part of the reason why this thing exists. At the beginnings of, of the description of Cuban flora and fauna, we have the first book, which is Columbus' diary. Already in his diary, Columbus is amazed at the flowers and the trees and the fruits that he finds in Cuba, and he writes them with exuberance in his diary. No drawings of. Then Gonzalo Fernandez de Oviedo, this, in the description of Cuba, again, he captures the image of a Cuba of, of vegetation and trees and beauty. No descriptions. The first images of Cuba were ordered by Philip II, who sent his physician to Cuba and Mexico in 1570. Um, the manuscript came back to the Escorial, but it was burnt in 1671. So no luck, no pictures of Cuba. Then something else happened in the world. This gentleman came around and Linnaeus decided that um, plants could be classified according to certain characteristics. 
and he devised a system to classify plants so that everything would be in its place. And he wrote that great book, and that's the way it works. Everything has a place. There has a kingdom, and there's a phylum, and there's a class, and an order, and a family, and a genus, and eventually you get the single plant. And that revolutionized knowledge, and the way to study plants, the way to study actually um, um, animals, and everything would have a name. And with that name, no matter where you were in the world, even if the common name, the vulgar name of your country and your language would be one, everybody in the world would talk the same language. Quite an, quite an adventure and quite a, an intuition. Then, after that failure of the plans of the, the uh, doctor of the, the king, um, I, I studied the um, pioneers of the Cuban botanical illustration. Uh, let me warn you that my research when I started this thing was almost 20 years ago, and I thought the matter was somewhat closed, so there may be, and I may be missing a few since then. But basically, this is what I found, that you have all these people, um, 10 pioneers before Our Lady came around, but as you can see, they did 144 illustrations in total, and only 49 had been printed. So if in 1827, you wanted to know something about Cuban plants, all you had is 49 images to go for, in, even if you had every book at your disposal. The others were, had a long story of loss. The history of Cuban botany illustration is a story of, of loss material and not publishing. For example, this is one of the few that are printed, the first gentleman. Then you have this particular beautiful collection. They were lost. Uh, for, for a century, and they were purchased in 79 by Hunt Institute, but for a century they were lost. Then you have this other guy, Guillaume. He did 67 plans, never got published until 1984. So some of the predecessors. Then you have the sweet swords. He has the little painting in the center, not, not much by way of illustration, but nevertheless, the valley, sorry. And then you have uh, Humboldt, who also went to Cuba. He printed a few items. And then you have Besa, who printed a couple of I one item. Then this is a fellow in Cuba who did this tobacco plant for the royal, with the royal um, <coughs> study of the plant. And finally, we have in the Curtis Botanical Magazine this particular um, tobacco plant from Cuba. And then De Curtils, who was a fellow who lived in Santo Domingo, visited Cuba and did this two illustrations. So as you see, not much was being done. And then we get to Our Lady, Kingsbury, Wollstonecraft. The first evidence of her name in print is in the left side in the New York Farmer, a journal of the Horticultural Society of New York which gave the news to the world that she was in Cuba. She had been painting these um, plants and that now she was ready for publication. They were sending this to New York. There's a gentleman's name there, Nathaniel Carter. He was an American also from New Hampshire who went to Cuba for health reasons, met Mrs. Wollstonecraft, and apparently he realized the significance of her botanical drawings. Indeed, he compares them to the most famous woman botanical um, drawer of the time, Sibylla Marion, who did work on uh, Suriname. And he was probably the, 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 it made her part with her manuscript to be sent to New York. As I mentioned earlier, the Cuban exiles working in Philadelphia editors of El Mensajero Semanal saw this particular news item and decided its Cuba content was significant enough to let it know to the Cuban people. So they translated the article into Spanish. And that is, by the way, how Treyes found out. Treyes found out not because he had access to the botanical magazine, <coughs> but because he had access to the, to the Mensajero. There's an interesting preface before the translation of this particular article. Um, by the way, the article 
made a mistake and translated her name as Wollstonecraft with an A. So we already have one name in the English publication, another name in the Spanish publication. But interestingly now, the little preface that you see the first, the first few lines before, before the translation, Sacco laments the fact in a, in a, in a, in a good way, I don't think it's, it's in a bad way, that he wishes, he's very happy, but he wishes that at some point would be a Cuban author who would do this, so that would bring glory to Cuba. So even though he's happy that this American woman is doing this, he's sort of saying, well, I hope that someday a Cuban would do that. Now that seemed innocent enough, but someone took offense at that little comment. And that someone was the arch rival of Sacco, who was Ramon de la Sagra. Ramon de la Sagra is a fundamental uh, individual in the history of Cuban natural history. He was a Spaniard who was sent to Cuba to, and eventually became the director of the botanical garden. He had the literary qualities of Cuba's foremost poet at the time, Jose Maria Heredia, and did a cr very critical um, analysis of his poetry, which infuriated the Cubans who said, you know nothing, you're just a dumb Spaniard, and how do you dare criticize Heredia, the great poet of our country? So Sacco was very upset at him, so they had a little running um, battle. So at one point, um, Ramon de la Sagra from Cuba wrote a letter back to the editors of El Mensajero Semanal, just saying all sorts of same things and saying that you've been poking at me with some of your articles. And he mentioned particularly the article of the Mrs. Wall, uh, Ms. Wollstonecraft, maybe because of that particular introduction saying, well, you wish they were Cuban, like saying you were really meaning me, that I'm here a Spaniard doing what Cubans should be doing. So he responds, and again, for the second time in Cuban history, the whole Wollstonecraft um, text appears in the, this somehow got lost. Um, anyway, so, but again, spelled with an A. So here we go, Treyes. When I was doing my research 20 years ago, I noticed the Wollstonecraft entry in Treyes bibliography, and I made the same decision he did. Treyes said, this is not a book I've seen, but someone mentioned it. So let's keep it for posterity. So I made the same decision in my book, which is outside there, um, on the Cuban illustration of natural history. And I said, I have no idea who this lady is. I have no idea who Nathaniel Carter was, how, what happened to these plants, but just so no one forget, um, I'm going to include the name of Wollstonecraft. So maybe some young scholar in the future would track down her work. At least we know that she existed. And since the Treyes edition of his bibliography was very limited, very few people would have access, and certainly very few in the United States, to her work. So on the right side is my incorporation of Wollstonecraft in my book, and then the left is Treyes. So that's, a, that's what I knew when I embarked on this operation. All I knew is that this Mrs. Wollstonecraft existed, until one day on March 31st of this year, I go through the internet looking for something on Cuba. I don't even remember what. And this thing came up. First of all, the name was Anne Kingsbury Wollstonecroft. Nothing to do with Wollstonecraft or with Wollstonecroft, but a totally different name. The date was not quite, but it was evident to me when I saw the name, I remembered the enigmatic Wollstonecraft that I had seen from Treyes and I had put in my book. So I immediately said, this is it. Um, interestingly enough, it said three volumes and Treyes had said three volumes. So everything pointed out to the fact that this was it, even though the name, I don't know who, Nan, who Anne was um, because her name was Wal Mrs. Wollstonecraft. So I didn't know the name. And it was a, a, a name spelled um, with Wollstonecroft, a totally diff a different name. So that's where we were. That's when I called Judith and I said, Judith, this is what I found. And the next day, because Judith doesn't waste any moment, 
as you probably know, she wrote to the Dean of Libraries at Cornell saying, here we come, here we come, whether you like it or not, because we're going to look at the manuscript. So eventually we made it and that's the picture you saw there. Since then, this is the bibliography I have been able to uh, find from her. She has had three um, sort of biographies. The first one is very interesting and is the one that gave me more knowledge. Uh, is by Samuel Knapp. Knapp is a Massachusetts antiquarian who decided to dab into biography and he's written several books on biography. One interesting book about the um, women's biographies. He has been criticized as being a little too effusive, too subjective, too interested in the subject, to have distance. And um, some people say that he somehow gets gets so happy with his biography by, by, by the people he, he studies that he sort of makes mistakes and is not unreliable. Nevertheless, his particular, his importance is to, to I mean, his, um, his description of this lady um, was clear that she, he knew the person. The reason he knew the person is because he was, as I learned later, he was the editor in Boston of a journal called the New York, the, the um, sort of, let me look. Boston something, um, let me see. His biography was called Female Biography, and he tells all sorts of things about Mrs. Wollstonecraft, except that he called her Mary, which doesn't help either. So he should call her Mary Wollstonecraft with a totally different name. So forget about Nancy, forget about Kingsbury. Um, so it just gets get very complicated to find the story. But he was saying um, that she was wonderful and that she was engaged in charitable work and that she moved to Cuba. And um, while there, her active mind was not only engaged in agriculture, but in botany and natural history. And then he says something cryptic. She wrote a series of letters upon Cuba. And I said, what letters? Who ever heard of the letters from Nancy Wollstonecraft? Where are they? So I had no idea. And then she says, she said, she wrote a letters of letters from Cuba, evincing more knowledge of the soil, climate, productions, manners, and customs of its inhabitants than any other one who has written on the subject. I said, how could this be? I mean, I, I fully commi committed to study Cuban bibliography, and I never heard of this woman, not only as a botanist, but much less as a writer of letters from Cuba. And then she goes on, he goes on to say all the things she did. And then he tells us, Mr. Mrs. Wollstonecraft held a most vigorous pet as the letters from Cuba and her article on the rights of women, the rights of women. He, she wrote an article on the rights of women just as her most famous sister-in-law, Mary Wollstonecraft, had some years before. So who is she? Why isn't she in the feminist bibliography? And she wrote an article on the rights of women. And then there it says, published in the Boston Monthly Magazine. Now, how does he know that? He knows that because he was the editor of the Boston Monthly Magazine. So, of course, he knew the identity of this lady because the articles in the Boston Monthly Magazine are anonymous. So we would have never known that she existed except for this Mr. Knapp who wrote her biography. Amazing. It's just a story of, you know, Cheryl Holmes trying to look for these things. So I went to look at the Boston Magazine. But before that, I'll tell you, after his mention, there's another fellow who attempted to write something about her, and that was Sawin. Thomas Sawin was a, um, a member of the Sawin family, and he wrote a little story about his family. Sawin is the brother-in-law of Nancy Kingsbury. He married Abigail, a sister. And he has a little note in his book about biographies of the families, but he places his, her death in New Orleans in 26, which we know it's not correct. And then we have a, 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 another bibliography from the Kingsbury side of the family, this pendulous edition of the genealogy, which Judith was kind enough to find for me. And there is another little 
the um, biography of Nancy, which places her death at Matanzas, Cuba, in 1828. So slowly you get, even with the wrong spelling of the name, you get an idea of who this lady was. And finally, there's this woman named Claire Tomlin, who did a study on Mary Wollstonecraft, the more famous Wollstonecraft of the family, who had written the feminist, but she mistakenly th said that the, um, when, when Nancy went to Cuba, she took the stepdaughter there, uh, which I don't think that's the way it happened. And then there's a gentleman, a professor in Philadelphia called Wayne B Bodle, whom I'm going to contact next week, who has written some on, uh, on Our Lady about um, her work with botany. So I, I, I'd like to interview him and see what else he knows. At any rate, here's where we are so far with Nancy. Um, this is the birth certificate that Judith can, uh, obtained for us, placing her in, uh, in New Hampshire when she was born. This is the biography from the Kingsbury family. Now, she arrives in Cuba, and this is the Cuba of, that, of those times. This is the United States on the left. It was a growing country. You had acquired Florida and acquired um, Louisiana, so it was a growing country and seeking expansion. Cuba had, um, at the time, abolished the slave trade. We already had a botanical garden and a fine art academy. There was a decree allowing free trade with ports, so a lot of activity was in the ports. In 1823, President Monroe had declared the Monroe Doctrine. Therefore, there was a, a, the presence of Cuba in the U.S. was more important. In 1824, the last battle in Latin America to become independent from Spain. As a response to that, the, Spain, the Spanish government responded by giving more power to the Captain General of Cuba, making Cuba a more absolutist place. The census revealed that Cuba was mostly black. And finally, the climate of Cuba is a place that became a healthcare destination. So that's the Cuba to which Mrs. Kingsbury arrived. And that's sort of her story. Um, she was born in Ringe, New Hampshire. She became orphan at age 12. Nothing is known between her youth and her marriage, uh, at least so far I haven't found anything. From her writings and the things I've been able to see, um, she must have lived in Boston or in the Massachusetts area because she can constantly makes reference to the gardens, to the people she visited, to to her experiences in gardens of other people. Then the husband dies at age 47 of yellow fever, places Nancy as the testamentary guardian of the daughter. And my, con my conclusion is that she had really no interest in taking care of the stepdaughter and entrusted her to a, to a priest, in, to, a, to a reverend of some sort, maybe Protestant, I suppose in New Hampshire. But there was a, a custody battle in which the actual um, white, the, the mother of the, of the girl kidnapped her. And then there was a custody battle. And because the young girl declared a preference for the mother, the New York court said, well, if the, if the girl wants to be with the mother and she is the actual mother, she should be there. So we know that she did not end up in Cuba. And then in 1819, a, a date I found in one of the writings, because we had no idea, we thought it was 1821, she moved to Cuba. And particularly she moved to Matanzas, which is a province to the right of Havana, if you look at the map. Um, I'm not sure why, maybe health reasons prompted her to go there. She, there was a place famous for coffee plantations. Many foreigners, Americans and French, had been working there as coffee planters. And maybe she thought that would be a good place to have a garden and to study the plants. In 1825, I learned from one of the documents, she visits New England. And I think that's when she met the Mr. Knapp, who then was the editor of her Letters of Cuba and her Rights of Women, of Women article. Because the connection seems clear to me that that's, that's how it happened. So she writes under the pseudonym of Danville. I don't know why she chose that name, but obviously it doesn't help to track her down when you use pseudonyms. The Natural Rights of Woman, which is actually a very interesting, I'll read something of that in a moment, 
in the Boston Monthly Magazine. And he describes in another page that she is a lady who resides near us. So I suppose that's the time she spent in Boston. Now this particular article is quite a feminist treatise, which I suppose some feminists should take a second look at it. And she starts by saying, it's, a, it's actually, she, she's very witty and she's very smart and very learned. I, I'm not sure where she learned all these things, but clearly she deserves a second look by American scholars. She starts very funny, says nearly 6,000 years have passed since the great creator of the universe crowned his labors by giving being to the most noble and intelligent of all his creatures, immortal man, male and female created he them, but declare them to be one, one flesh, one mind. To them, he directed his divine commands and gave them rule over all that he had made. Their wisdom, their intelligence, their sovereignty was equal. God blessed them both and gave them united dominion over the earth and the sea and bade them to continue as he had created them in love and harmony. He looked upon all that he had made and beholding it was good, he rested from his labors. But it seems that man soon became wiser than his maker and discovered that the Almighty was mistaken or had made a mistake and all the mind, or at least the greatest part of it, had been bestowed upon himself, and that woman had received only a poor pittance, the mere livings and scrapings that could be gathered after his own bra wise brain was furnished. At what precise period this important secret was found out by man remains to the researchers of the curious to determine. So she really was quite upset. I'm sure living in Cuba, she, she, always, she felt the machismo even worse, and the end is, and then she goes on and explaining how woman has been part of everything. I mean, and then she studies the educational system of France and the United States. I mean, she said it's a, it's a great treatise on the status of women in the 1820s in the world. She's really done comparative research and says that even in the US, even though she had more opportunities, even the educational system was stacked against it. And the end says, ladies are no longer afraid nor ashamed to be acquainted with history with geography, with natural history, or with whatever has a tendency to enlarge their views, strengthen their understanding, improve their taste, or amend their heart. So, you know, um, she goes on to say how wonderful it is that women have come a long way since then. But we wouldn't have known it was her, except that her editor had the, 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 the fortune of putting her name in the, in the in biography, even though, he calls her Mary, and we would have never thought it was Nancy. Uh, nevertheless, there it is. And then we go to the letters from Cuba, which I've gone to the bibliography, and I have not found any references to the letters of Cuba in any Cuban bibliography. So they remain to be studied, analyzed, and published, and translated into Spanish. So here we have another task. The first letter from Cuba was in April 26, in this Boston Monthly magazine. And... Um, it, it's really a treatise of the Cuba's natural history. She doesn't dwell that much on the social customs of Cuba, although occasionally she mentions some, but it's a, an incredibly detailed and learned study on the climate, the geography, the soils, the rivers, the bays, the harbors, and the second letter is mostly about botany. So she clearly had a very good knowledge, and the best moment of my, when I was reading this, which I was fascinated because I had never read this incredible work in Cuban history, the best moment for me was when it said at one point, um, um, she's describing some flowers and she says, but all these with many others are accurately delineated and colored according to nature in my specimens of the plants of Cuba which is the title of the manuscript that Judith and I found in Cornell. So there's clearly, even though her name is not, doesn't appear in the, in the article, um, my feeling is that there were more letters to be written. The magazine ended suddenly with this article and maybe her name would appear in the last letter because it seems that she's cut off of the narrative. But the fact that she mentions the title of the book in her article, 
makes it very clear that we're talking about the same woman, the one who wrote The Rights of Woman, the one who wrote two letters about Cuba of such a detailed and knowledge of Cuba that it really is, a, I don't know how she escaped the radar of Cuban historians. So um, then the next thing is that we know that in 1827, she meets this Nathaniel Carter, who was also from New Hampshire, an expatriate in Cuba, who went there for health reasons. He would die a couple of years later in New York. And he's the one, I think, who pushed her for the publication of the book. He was a member of the Hardship Cultural Society, as I said. He, when he saw the manuscript, he must have been in awe, because at that date, as I say, only 145 images had been done, and she had done 124 at least. So she had done almost the entire output of everybody else for centuries. Um, so she's the first woman to do that, the first American to do that, and the person whose corpus of work was the most important. So if anyone has any doubt of the significance of this manuscript, there you have the answer. Um, then in 27, the father dies in Boston. Maybe she traveled. In April of 28, the drawings are already in New York. We know that from the newspaper. And she died that year. So maybe her death, so premature at age 46, maybe her death has something also to do with the fact that these things were never published. Because as Judith and I remarked when we saw the manuscript, there are still holes in the manuscript, like if there will be some further information to be added, maybe not being around, no one said, well, you know, this now she's not around to publish. So we don't know what happened, whether it was lack of subscribers, her death, the fact that no one was there to finish the manuscript. But in any event, we know that from her Kingsbury kins, the... Um, the manuscript ended up with a um, with a father of a who would be a professor at Cornell, who in who when he died in 18, 1915, deeded it to his son, who then gave it to um, oh I'm sorry I'm, who gave it to his um, Cornell University. Now, Mrs. Kingsbury, the botanist, she clearly knew botany. I mean, she's not only someone who drew plants like. A few years later, would do Federica Bremer, a Swedish uh, tr traveler to Cuba, who would do a few plans. She knew, by, uh, she had in all her descriptions, uh, linear terminology and classification. She, she uses the words uh, appropriately. And she mentions all these people, Olaf Swartz, Hans Lohn, John Lunen, Giovanni Molina in the National History of Chile. I mean, she quotes excerpts from this book, so she clearly has access at some point, <coughs> and she has. Um, she was even interested in soil analysis. At one point, she sent them to Cambridge University, which at first I thought it would be Cambridge, England, but at one point she puts Cambridge, US, which I presume it's Harvard, although she never mentioned the word Harvard. She uses Cambridge Botanical Garden. And she had a correspondence with a, a certain Charles Miller, whom I haven't discovered yet, sending soil from Cuba, so he analyzes this thing for farmers. So she was very active. At one point, she mentions that in her garden, she had imported a plant from St. Kitts. So she had a, you know, a, an incredible life in Cuba doing all sorts of things. I tried in Cuban archives and in Cuban magazines of the time, there's only one journal in 1828, in Havana, and I found nothing. However, since I learned that her life was in Matanzas, my next step is to go to see in Matanzas next month a, a journal very important called La Aurora de Matanzas, maybe in that journal, because I, I doubt that she was not known in Cuba. I mean, she had to be known for her activities in Matanzas. And I'm going to try to find a death certificate and hopefully to find her tomb. So stay tuned for the next, uh, next report on, on what we find. Now, the question is, with all her knowledge, was she, was she studied somewhere? Was she self-taught? I don't know, but in, in one of the manuscripts, she says, the tree which bears the flower represented, um, it may be that I have mistaken the genus and the species to which botanists have assigned it, but without either books to inform or scientific friends to correct, it would be astonishing if I didn't make any mistakes in nomenclature and in the artificial arrangement of plants. Nature. Um, I have yet, I have yet not had so much as a single conversation with a botanist 
much less a lesson to describe the plans. No aid from others have aided me. So it's hard for me to think that she had no knowledge. So I'm, I'm tending to believe that that statement is more about her life in Cuba, that she had no one in Cuba and certainly in Matanza's coffee planter who were interested in planting, not so much as whether it was a, a Dicotolidonia or you know, Eritrinia Eritrea. Um, I have a feeling that that's really her complaint. I cannot believe she had, obviously she had access to books because her, her, her manuscript shows it. And now we go to the moment. And then she was a lover of poetry. In fact, the Knapp biography says she was a poet. I have found many, in, in some of her pages of the manuscripts, there are some poets mentioned, Richard Blackmore, and she has one called Sweet Floret, which I would not be surprised if it was her own poetry. So we have a very active woman, very intelligent, very learned, uh, very observant. Her descriptions of the climate and the soil of Cuba is one of the best I've ever read. And um, I'm sure that we will soon have it translated for Cuban readers. And maybe when we do a book in both languages, all of these things will come and people will celebrate her keen observance of Cuba. And now we go to the moment we're waiting for. This is the manuscript, Specimens of the Plants and Fruits of Cuba, which is the name she mentions in the book. So it is wonderful to have a, a contemporaneous, um, she starts with a little poem there, you see. And of the three volumes, she has 121 illustrated plates and 220 pages of descriptive text for each image, she has two pages of description, quite detailed. I mean, it's amazing how much time she spent describing the plan for us. The last number plate is 145, and some are missing, so I don't know whether she meant to go there and never did it, or they were lost somewhere in transition. Um, but that's the way. Anyway, and, and then we, had, we were lucky enough to have one page loose in the book, which had sketches. So clearly that's the way the process starts. She goes to the plant, she takes a little, a little initial description, and eventually they become the full plates. In very important to have found this because we can see how the process of botanical illustration works from a sketch to a fuller description. And finally, we have the beautiful images. What I've tried to do here is to put the name, on top is the name she uses, she uses sometimes, almost all the time, a Latin name, after Linnaeus, um, and then an English name. Sometimes she puts a Spanish name. On the left side, it's something I'm, I'm working on as I go along, which is the, the name in Latin. As, as you may know, Linnaeus wrote many years ago, and since then, botanists have been um, upgrading and being a little better at classification of plants. So we have sometimes a new synonym or a new name for a plant. So I'm trying to get the, uh, I have, I'm, I'm, uh, the, the new name for the plant so people know in the botanical world what we're talking about. Then I'm having other English names. And finally, the Spanish name because these plants were found in Cuba. And eventually we want to have a bilingual book so Cubans would know what the name of the, of the I have contacted a Cuban botanist who worked with me in the, my earlier book, and we're working on the Spanish names for this plant, so we all know what we're talking about. So this is the first one of the book, uh, which is, as you can see, a magnificent drawing. It's, it's in full color. No one, by the way, had done color. I mean, this is very nicely, the size of this manuscript is unique. And then that's the way the, the, pal the following pages read. This happens to be the description of the plant which preceded that particular plant. This is the Cana Indica, and then she goes on to explain what they're used for, and then describes in, in detail and uh, quite clear handwriting, I should say. So we go quickly now through some of the specimens I want to share with you. And as you can see at the bottom, she, she takes the time of, of taking this, the, the pieces of the plant, so you can see. I mean, it's, a bot it's not just a nice drawing, it's a scientific botanic illustration. I have to say that for 190 years of, of, uh, of, uh, of, 
of life. They, they have kept their, their beauty and the color. Uh, so Cornell has done an extraordinary job in the preservation of this material. Look at that. Okay, sorry, I didn't want to take more of your time, but I can look at that. It's amazing the, the detail. I mean, she must have spent so many hours just doing this thing right and then coloring them. We're very fortunate to have found this. Look at that, the passion flower. Judith, of course, was thinking already of wallpaper and all sorts of, all sorts of market-oriented. I mean, they're they're extraordinary. I mean, nothing Cuba had ever seen until now. No one, no one had ever done this, because La Sagra, the guy who was upset of that little note that Sacco said, he then went on to become the most important uh, editor of science of natural history in Cuba, and he himself. Uh, went, in pa went to Paris and published a magnificent book, and he had 102 plants, but even La Sagra didn't match the 122 that Mrs. Kingsbury had done, and they are not in color. So as you can see, nothing in colonial, in 500 centuries of Cuba, this is the most important grouping of Cuban botanical drawings. So you, you probably, if you were to use this, you would have your case for your iPhone with this thing. <laughs> yeah, the avocado. And she goes on in the, in, in the letters from Cuba, she goes on to explain the avocado like I have seen no description. And the uses in Cuba and how important it is. And it's with salt, it's wonderful. I mean, it's just, and now we have, of course, the cashew apple, marañón. Look at that. The guava. Pomegranate. mango. In, in her letters from Cuba, she says, I don't know how they got to Cuba. Although I, she's, I mean, she really, you know, when she was there, she inquired from people, how did this get here? What do you know about it? I mean, she really did not spend her time just here. She was a, a great observer. I mean, she's one of the keenest observers I've seen of Cuban nature. The guanabana, wonderful fruit. And Aranjagria, wonderful for a seasoning. The okra. I mean, the, the, she must have taken the paper, the color. I mean, just think of how Matanzas 1820. You know, where did she get this paper? It's just extraordinary. Malanga, that's very important root in Cuban cuisine. 
put the detail in that. So eventually the, the, the right-hand sum column will be filled out with the new names and the correct names so that when the, when the book gets published, we have, we'll have a, something very useful to botanists, not only for people who enjoy seeing beautiful botanical illustrations. The detail on that. No wonder Mr. Carter, when she saw this thing in Matanzas Coffee, can you imagine going, walking into a Matanzas Coffee plantation in 1820 and finding these things? He must have been, you know, he must have been as amazed as Judith and I were. My God, what is this doing here? Why isn't this being uh, digitalized? Of course, he wouldn't have used that word. But certainly, the, certainly that's the idea. The fruta bomba. Look at that. Yeah, it's just. Thank you very much. Any questions?